Hey the UTB and CJ Holmes here. All right, well, here's the next part of the Titanic build. I've stepped away from the stern section for a couple of days, and I want to work on the bow section seabed. I've already begun um, to build up the uh, area where the bow plowed into the seabed, and uh, I've, I've built it up with uh, little blocks of poplar wood. I've already finished, you know, for the most part, the port side. One of the key things to keep in mind is that the bow section plowed itself into the mud up to about six feet from um, the anchor on the port side. So you've got a little bit of gap between seabed and anchor there. And then the seabed rises a little bit and then gradually drops off back toward uh, the stern. So this is what I've been doing in order to build up uh, this area here. I don't want to just pack it with uh, cellulose because it'll take forever to dry. Um, whatever you use, if you want to use plaster or build up sand or rocks or whatever you uh, choose to do, uh, you do need to build up this area here. On the starboard side, uh, the seabed has uh, been plowed up right to the base of the starboard anchor. So uh, that's what I've been doing, uh, just uh, building up blocks of wood that I've uh, cut out of poplar. So I'm running a little more uh, glue there and then just finding a piece of wood. I cut up a bunch of blocks on the bandsaw, just random pieces. And I think we're going to put something there and uh, maybe throw a piece there. kind of like that. It's going to be irregular, which is uh, kind of the effect I'm trying to achieve. How did I have that kind of like that? Cool. All right. This, for the most part, uh, is dried. I don't think I need to add any more pieces of wood. But now it's time to just uh, start getting my hands muddy and uh, work the clay onto uh, onto the base. Come on, stick. I probably should wait for this glue to dry, but uh, anyway, it'll dry with the clay. The clay will likely absorb a lot of that glue. This is the procedure that I'm using. I think I'm going to throw a little bit more wood in there because I want that not to um, go down so rapidly. So we're going to make it a little more gradual. Now keep in mind a couple hundred yards uh, forward of the bow section is the, um, the forward well deck uh, hatch. I'm not going to be showing that on this, uh, it would be far too close and, and uh, out of scale. I haven't decided yet whether to, how much uh, debris to put on the stern section. I'm leaning toward making a separate um, display of uh, the debris field. Uh, what would it be to the uh, east and southeast of the uh, stern? But we'll see. Got a ways to go before we do that. Yeah, I'm just letting the clay overlap here. 
I'm going to sand it off after it dries. It's uh, hot. And, well, actually, it's kind of humid today. It rained a bit this morning here in the high desert. But generally, it's uh, warm and dry. So uh, I'll stick this outside for a couple of days. And uh, it'll, it'll dry the clay. careful not to cover up that anchor and then I have to pick it free and do a lot of repainting and I don't want to really have to do that so just try to be careful building up right to the hull. It kind of dips down forward here. Now the uh, cellulose clay, the paper mache material, um, if uh, past experience proves right, it's um, likely going to shrink some, and so there may be some gaps that'll have to be filled in after it dries. That's fine. I'm prepared for such eventuality. It, uh, of course, almost every operation that I work in, I end up uh, <coughs> making a mess. But this does tend to be messy. So I would recommend, uh, if you get a bunch on your hands, to uh, try to rub as much of it off before you, uh, let's say you go to the sink and, and wash your hands. You can really clog up the pipes with with this stuff. I've unfortunately been uh, kind of suffering from uh, just general, I just am tired of the build again, but I'm not going to uh, abandon it for months at a time like I did last time getting kind of sick of looking at that stern so anyway that's why I'm doing kind of a change of scenery here working on the bow section I don't know if last time uh, you guys saw the bow it may have been painted more in uh, the colors like right after it sank so the white was whiter and the uh, anti-fouling paint what do you call that anti-rust paint anyway the the rust colored paint was more uh, rusty looking but since then I've uh, sprayed a few coats to get it kind of more to 1985 uh, colors and then once all this uh, seabed is done then we'll be able to work on fine details get the rusticles on the uh, hull applied by the thousands
and just do finishing touches. I notice uh, in here, uh, I, don't I don't remember, it's been so long whether I had put Captain Smith's bathtub in there and it fell out or I just hadn't gotten to it yet. But anyway, I will get to it sometime. Now there's, uh, I think, a bit of disagreement lately. The latest uh, um, expedition to the Titanic, uh, some people were under the impression that the bathtub had collapsed down to a lower deck and so was lost. But uh, I've heard others say, no, the bathtub's still there. It's just that debris from above has fallen on it and obscured it. I don't know. I honestly haven't looked at a lot of um, pictures from the, what is it, the 2014 or 2019? Anyway, there are some recent expeditions uh, to the ship. I just, I really haven't, uh, haven't paid a lot of attention to it. And someday, I believe, you know, once... Once I get a clear picture of what it looks like lately, we're in 2023 right now, um, I may do another build um, showing it in its current condition. But it's always subject to change. Um, the ship is constantly deteriorating and uh, what condition it's in today will not be the same condition in a couple of years. Because the, the discovery of the ship in 85 was such a milestone, um, that, that's the way I always picture uh, the wreck, is in its 1985 condition. I just hate seeing it deteriorate anymore. Of course, ideally, um, they would have avoided the iceberg altogether, and we would have never heard about the Titanic. It would just be another uh, liner that, you know, lived another fate. But it happened, so so we uh, we deal with the consequences and work on the history. One thing, oh, I just, in hindsight, I sure wish somebody had uh, the money and the foresight to have preserved the Olympic, which lived a long and, and a successful career. Old, reliable. And was it 1935 that finally uh, it was no longer profitable and the ship was... Uh, sold and scrapped so all we really have th there's really more <laughs> more of the britannic and the titanic preserved beneath the ocean waves uh, than there are of the olympic just some woodwork remains of uh, the olympic but the ship is gone oh if only somebody had chosen to spend the money to preserve that beautiful ship. What an attraction it would be. I'm uh, in Southern California, so I'm not far from the uh, Queen Mary. And uh, that ship is, uh, I believe it's now just uh, being restored again. It was in dire uh, condition. For a while, there's uh, actually a threat of it uh, sinking. <laughs> the hull was in bad, bad shape. So I don't know what the status is of it right now, but I believe efforts have been made to uh, restore it and get it back in uh, in tourist-worthy condition. I've been on it once or twice, and actually. Uh, attended a meeting inside its its grand ballroom walked the decks and oh, I just didn't appreciate it 
or uh, what it was at the time. Actually, a little more than a hundred feet longer than the Olympic class ships. Just a magnificent uh, vessel. Yeah, so this is uh, coming along nicely. One distraction that I've had, uh, I have so many interests and hobbies. I think I've uh, mentioned before, I'm working on uh, reverse engineering the Zapruder film of the Kennedy assassination. I'm still waiting for the film to be uh, developed from the guys in New York. Let's see how that turns out. Uh, I've amassed a collection of uh, most of the cameras that were used by uh, amateurs and uh, the press that were used uh, on the day of the assassination. Of course, not the original cameras. Uh, the originals are, uh, <clears throat> for the most part, you know, the key important cameras, for the most part are in the Sixth Floor Museum in uh, Dallas. Um, of course, the uh, Bell & Howell Zapruder camera is in the National Archives, as is the original film. But, um, come November, hopefully I'll have that film back and it'll be in displayable condition, so I will be projecting it uh, with an 8mm camera as it was shown to the Secret Service and Life magazine and uh, Dan Rather of uh, CBS. In November of 63. And I'll also be doing a couple of uh, videos on uh, the cameras that were used to film uh, before, during, and after the assassination. Now, another tangent I've been on, I've never been a ufologist. It interested me as a child, and uh, my opinion about UFOs is uh, based upon my limited uh, study investigation. Um, most can be accounted for as natural phenomena. Uh, it's interesting that the government is apparently increasingly making noise about the reality of UFOs anyway. Um, in the 1960s, it was really, really a big thing. And uh, one of the most um, controversial, because it is perhaps one of the most authentic set of photographs of the uh, of a UFO uh, it's called the Heflin UFO back in uh, August of 1965 in Santa Ana California there was a fellow named Rex Heflin who uh, worked for uh, Orange County um, Highway Department or something anyway is kind of an inspector he would go around uh, looking uh, you know for anomalies or problems with traffic signs and such. And Rex Heflin, one afternoon, was uh, parked on Myford Drive, just south of Walnut Avenue in Santa Ana, and uh, noticed uh, that there was a, a railroad crossing sign that was obscured by uh, some tree branches. So, one of his jobs was to take photographs of uh, these problem conditions and then report back and then have uh, the crews come out and do the uh, correction. So anyway, he's parked and he's prepared to, uh, to take this uh, picture of the obscured sign. He goes to radio into his home base and his radio doesn't work. 
and he noticed uh, just off the left side, just the corner of his uh, left eye, some movement. And he saw a flying object uh, crossing, slowly crossing Myford Road at uh, uh, relatively low elevation and low speed. So he had his camera with him, a Polaroid 101, and uh, took a series of four photographs of the UFO crossing the, hi the uh, highway, crossing the road. And uh, anyway, that's going to be a, another video because I am going to go and visit that area. It's built up now. It was Orange Groves in Santa Ana. It was very close to El Toro. Um, is it Marine Base? Air Force Base? I think Marine Base. Anyway, I think Marine Base. It was just north of El Toro. And his assumption at the time was that uh, the UFO was an experimental uh, military craft. He didn't think it was little green men or anything. Anyway. Um, I've always been interested in that series of photographs. I have a Polaroid 101 camera on the way in that... I paid an exorbitant amount. I think I paid at least $3.99 for it, plus shipping, which wasn't much. That should be coming in tomorrow. So, I will be doing uh, a video on that someday. But, I have no fear of Titanic fans. Uh, this, this will uh, continue. So, yeah, so, I have a lot of different interests. Speedway motorcycles, um, the JFK assassination, guitar playing and making and repairing, and astronomy, telescopes, microscopes, goodness gracious, uh, plastic model kits from the 50s and 60s, <clears throat> way too many hobbies. But... There we go. There's the uh, bow section. Pretty much finished. I'll uh, take that outside. I think it's it's going to be rain free, and uh, give that a couple of days to dry. All right. I'm going to put you on pause for a second. Then I'm going to bring the uh, stern section over here. Be right back. Alrighty then. Well, never mind about taking the uh, bow section outside. It's starting to drizzle a little bit. So, I uh, just set it aside and now I'm going to use what little remaining uh, clay I have left. And I'm going to build up the area around the uh, propellers. Because there's far too much showing can you see that what I'm doing there Inside the uh, propeller wings. So yeah, anyone uh, interested in uh, in UFOs, uh, my uh, one interest, because 
uh, the area is close by you know, within a hundred miles from my location I want to go and and take some uh, some films of just uh, where this UFO encounter happened again it's the Heflin UFO if you look that up you'll see the uh, pictures kind of a hat shaped object it was initially deemed uh, to be a genuine set of photographs and then another couple of groups studied it and said no it's definitely a hoax uh, because uh, the clouds uh, don't match in one of the photographs and I, we can see a string um, suspending the UFO so it likely wasn't more than about nine inches long and he dangled it in front of uh, in front of the truck however the group that studied the photographs and deemed it a hoax were dealing with like fourth generation poor quality photos subsequent <laughs> another really strange uh, turn of events with the Heflin UFO. All right, so Rex Heflin takes these pictures. Doesn't make a big deal about it. He never made any money off of uh, the photos. Never sought uh, a lot of publicity. It showed him to friends. Anyway, some people who uh, identified themselves as being from NORAD knocked on his door one day and said, hey, uh, we'd like to take those photographs, borrow them from you. And study them. He said, fine, go ahead and take them. He had already made copies of the Polaroids. The original photographs are only like three inch by four inch. Anyway, so he, uh, he loaned out the uh, photos, never saw them again. Tried to get them back, and nobody knew uh, who had them. A lot of denial and such. And so he was like, oh well. Anyway, in 1993, was it 28 years later? He gets a phone call. And a woman's voice says, uh, I don't know if she asked him, have you checked your mailbox? Or tells him, go check your mailbox. He goes out checks his mailbox there's nothing there comes back in the house gets a call same woman go check your mailbox he goes out again checks the mailbox finds a little manila envelope inside are the original polaroid photographs that's x-file stuff you know that <laughs> to me that's more mysterious than the actual pictures themselves So the uh, Polaroids were studied. The original camera, original photos were studied. And they determined that uh, the cloud pattern, overcast cloud pattern, shown in photo four of the, the smoke ring, uh, was really consistent with uh, the photographs taken of the UFO itself. Uh, there was no evidence of any string. In fact, uh, the, the copy photographs that may have shown a string may have been uh, manipulated in order to disprove the, uh, the reality or the authenticity of the photos. Sorry I'm talking so much about that, but there's not much more to say uh, about uh, RMS Titanic <clears throat> other than... Um, yeah, that's, uh, that mud is coming along nicely. A little bit more here. Really pack it up tightly against the hull. Okay, that's looking pretty good. 
Now my goal uh, for the next video is to continue with the uh, stern and start to add details. I haven't forgotten the uh, little wall with, are they windows or doors that belong here? Uh, it's gonna, there's going to be a lot of debris that uh, is going to be added all along uh, the stern section. And I'll be doing the plating that's overlapping the engines and dropping down to the side. My goal is to make it removable because uh, anyway, personally, I just I love the work that I did on those engines and it would be nice to be able to pop off that uh, section to reveal um, the reciprocating engines because they're pretty much covered up to the uh, high pressure cylinders. Oh, there we go. Uh, we've uh, actually gone 30 minutes. And I think that's a bit for now. I'm going to add a little more mud right there. I also do plan to uh, continue working on um, a model of the ship showing the uh, engine rooms and boilers and such. I have the uh, uh, little blades that I made. I cast these in uh, resin from uh, the original model. So those will be going on the uh, hull of the of the next uh, model that I'm making. All right, there you go. So we've got the um, bow section waiting in the wings to be uh, set outside to dry. I'm happy with uh, the stern section. And uh, we'll uh, leave it for that. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Have a nice day.